thanks again. Appreciate every member of the audience here making time uh, on a day like this to come and listen to us. And we are going to sh uh, share with you some exciting stuff that we've done with threat modeler, particularly in the context of how to automate threat modeling uh, uh, from an application perspective. Uh, while I was kind of preparing this uh, uh, set of presentation, kind of uh, looking at some of the articles, of, and, and I happened to notice uh, a particular article uh, from Mary that came out uh, this morning, actually, it talks about the CISO's new responsibilities about building trust. I said, oh, wow, interesting that the CISOs are in, the, in this new role of res and responsible building trust. So what more uh, better context would that serve for this uh, uh, webinar? So with that, with that being said, part of this webinar, what we're gonna cover is a several set of uh, topics that, that kind of touch upon particularly many of you folks who are practicing threat modeling on a day-to-day -day basis or trying to adopt threat modeling within your enterprise. We all know what the shift left um, strategy that many enterprises are embarking upon. Uh, there are a number of challenges in terms of how do we effectively threat model particularly given how, uh, how many applications are there in an enterprise space or within your enterprise. So part of this agenda will cover some of the challenges and we'll also talk about what Avocado and Threat Modeler have partnered and bringing to this uh, uh, industry. And also we'll talk about generally, that's the solution that we kind of uh, uh, have built. How is it deployed? What kind of races and workflows uh, are, are required to enable an automated threat modeling? And then we'll kind of walk into a specific demo, uh, talks, talking about exactly how this is done and we'll see some things come real to life uh, in that demo. So I wanna make sure you get the full breadth of the experience here. Obviously we'll have a Q and A session, feel free to jump in uh, during that session and ask any specific questions, but doesn't, doesn't prevent you from asking questions on the chat, feel free to fire off and there'll be folks that will be uh, answering any questions as, as we go to, okay? With that said, um, I was just kind of thinking about uh, what would be a set of challenges typically in, uh, in adopting threat modeling. We've done many customer uh, engagements in Avocado and Threat Modeler together. One of the common themes when we kind of interview and talk to some of the key personas that are trying to adopt threat models is, is, is one, or, or these challenges that came up. Uh, when we talk to some of the development engineers and saying, hey, you know, uh, I know you guys are embarked on threat modeling. What is, is there a challenge for you to adopt it successfully and, and, and drive threat modeling as a, a, as a hygiene within your uh, organization? The common answer or the common theme that we seem to be getting is, hey, I have 30 developers. I don't want them to be tied into threat modeling exercise because today's threat modeling work is a lot of uh, manual work to be done a lot of questions, questionnaires to be answered, and we don't have time for it because we have our business priorities to deliver capabilities for our business, so we don't want to pull our developers into doing this. And likewise, the security folks are also screened because now the developers are not participating and they can't do it alone in, in a silo. And likewise, the operations folks also have the similar kind of challenge. And as the number of applications in an enterprise grows, this becomes an undaunting task for anybody to manage. And this is one of the primary reasons why people kind of shy away from threat modeling to make it part of their day-to-day -day, uh, work. So then subsequently, we also did talk to several C CIOs and kind of trying to understand why, why, what is their investment strategy in, in terms of threat modeling? And, and one of the common answers we get, hey, look, uh, we have so many great tools in the industry but the problem is it's not about the tools. It's not about, the, it is the amount of time I spend and what is the return on the investment for me to do something like this when I have a large application portfolio. They said at the end of the day, when we finish our threat modeling, just 10% of my ecosystem gets covered. And these will be typically the ones that we know are, are most critical applications. We know from a threat perspective or a threat vector perspective, the, the weakest link in the chain is the one that probably gets exploited the most. Uh, so it is hard for us to kind of put our fingers on the, uh, on the button here and say, hey, we have addressed all the critical threat areas and then we have eliminated at least most of the threats that, that could potentially jeopardize our environment or applications. 
And similarly, when we talk to the CISOs, the challenge the CISOs face is like the article as kind of shared on the first page is they are now being empowered to make decisions from a, a, a organization perspective in terms of security. But the challenge that's out there is that how do you bring in the trust? How do you, how does a CISO understand the application risk without even understanding what the applications are? This is where we focused our energy with threat modeler to kind of bring to uh, bring out a solution that makes uh, that adds significant value for all these various personas. Okay, um, and here's one customer where we did actually a case study. Uh, they did they did spend a lot of time and energy in, on on trying to do threat modeling. But at the end of the day, they spent about five million dollars. I tried to spend about five million dollars, including not just software costs and deployment costs, etc., but a lot of people. And then they spent about five million, but then still at the end of the day, they ended up with an imprecise threat model. And also their threat models got updated because the applications automatically changed with newer versions and they didn't go back to go do the threat model. So this is what we're trying to solve part of our end of okay? Now, before I jump into this, I wanna just give you guys a quick idea of what Avocado does and what are the capabilities of Avocado that we leveraged. And likewise, when we talk about threat modeling, threat modeler too, there are capabilities in threat modeling. The marriage of these two technologies are what is making this very attractive. First of all, within Avocado, we, we are a, a application security company focused on securing applications uh, uh, using zero trust, using some of our patented technologies like Pico, Pico segmentation uh, uh, and also machine learning. But what we did part of this endeavor here is we have a capability called Reveal that is part of the platform it's basically sitting inside the application and providing deep application forensics on all the application data flows that's happening in runtime without even modifying your application. So when we deploy our, our plugins into the application and, and enable the applications to start discovering all the flows, all that information that's collected is then fed into threat model, which takes the synthesized context sensitive application relevant forensic or metadata, then automatically creates this threat model that's very relevant to the application. This is one of the key things that I wanna point out is the threat models that we generate part of this automation is very application centric and is very application specific. This is what drives some of the benefits for the various personas I talked about, because now when you generate the threat model, it is very context sensitive there. So you know what to focus on from your application perspective and address those challenges. Obviously threat model brings in a lot of other capabilities besides the application based uh, forensics and, and the threat models we generate, it also generates other threat vectors and other, other kinds of potential threats in your ecosystem, whether it's a cloud or any other environment. What we bring here is how do you marry any of those cloud-based solutions to a prem-based solutions and providing you a full, band, full broad spectrum view of all the threats across an enterprise, irrespective of where the applications are running, whether it's in a private data center or in a cloud, et cetera, okay? So that is what we're bringing to the table and we want to share that with you. Typically, a uh, lot of enterprises are moving towards this DevSecOps um, uh, mindset and also shifting left. Uh, just to lay on the, la uh, put, the put it on the landscape, uh, on the left side you see here where we have the deep application visibility of reveal and threat modeler playing a very critical role during the verification and the pre-production phase of an application before it's promoted to the production. So you have this continuous cycle wherein you threat model an application, how many hour times you want release up to release. If you're doing a daily release, you'll be able to do it daily. If you're doing a monthly release, you can do a monthly release or anything that you are, you're looking at from a threat modeling perspective on a continuous mode is what we are trying to achieve part of this uh, automation and capability, okay? Now, having kind of talked to you about these two capabilities, what I want to kind of walk you through is what is the deployment approach? The deployment approach is pretty straightforward. And as you can see, the first and foremost thing is 
identifying your applications and deploying the plugins. With Avocado from, from the Avocado security platform, you'll be able to push the plugins into your application ecosystem. And once you restart your applications automatically and start testing your application, automatically Avocado is gonna start collecting all the metadata and forensics and inspecting all the various flows that are happening and collecting all that information. Once that information is collected and once you've finished your testing of your application, that is when you go into a, a module where you can generate a threat model or an application model from using, uh, using the tool set in a JSON format. This JSON becomes very useful. Again, the JSON is available as one of download formats. Also, there are APIs available wherein if you have an automation purpose, you can integrate to that API using that automation. And then once you have the JSON, you basically import that JSON with all the forensics into threat modeler, and then you'll be able to generate your threat model and subsequently take action, uh, prioritize your uh, uh, threats, prioritize your attacks, and also be able to create tickets into JIRA and mitigate all your threats. Too. And you, you don't have to do it in one shot or one time, you can start doing it continuously. And this also gives you an ability to see how your application threat model has progressed release over release, so you understand the whole threat landscape as the application matures. Okay. Typically, the workflow is fairly straightforward. Uh, we kind of take, take an approach where our, the, the amount of involvement from a workflow perspective is minimized to only a key set of personas that are able to add value. This is mostly in the prerequisite stage and the reporting stage is when they get heavily informed. Otherwise, most of the work that's done is automated by Avocado and Threat Modeler. So you don't have to worry about how to draw your threat diagrams or architecture diagrams and how to collect the data from the developers. All those tasks, the task that, that's all the white space exists is kind of basically eliminated by this approach. Okay. Now, having kind of uh, talked to you about those things, this is where we see some of the benefits the various personas particularly if you are a CISO, now since you have automated the whole landscape of threat modeling and generating threat, the threat information and providing you the visibility where the threat exists or what are the potential threats, the CISO is able to uh, understand the risk posture and also prioritize the decision and reduce the cost so they're not focusing the energy on things that are not relevant. From a developer perspective, there's productivity benefits, your security awareness and also drive some accountability because now the developers really know how to kind of pull the needle out of the haystack and understand what's actually happening within their application for that specific uh, threat. And also from a security architecture perspective, it provides them a way to enforce security by design and also enforce architecture, security architecture governance over a set of applications across the enterprise. From an operations perspective, it obviously helps them understand where to focus on from an application perspective in case there's an issue or which application has an issue and be able to act upon and manage the change of those applications appropriately, just reducing operation fatigue. So this is a general set of benefits that we see obviously, depending on where, which industry you're on, what you're doing, it might vary and some of the benefits might, change, might be relevant to those areas too, okay. And at the end of the day, the outcomes that we plan to achieve or at least have achieved part of this automation is ability to manage a large number of applications at scale. You know, instead of doing 20 applications, now we are able to do thousands of applications. The, since because of the automation we bring in and minimization of the number of people involved in doing a threat model, it is now becoming extremely cost effective from a, from a cost perspective in terms of time savings, et cetera. Also, there's minimal developer involvement unless there is some specifics of development uh, application that the developer needs to get involved. And the other key aspect is the results that we produce will be highly precise to the application. And then you can expand upon that and use that for a continuous threat modeling and governance. With that said, what I'm gonna do is now jump into a quick demo to show how this is actually working in real time. So what 
we have done is we have deployed uh, our uh, threat uh, reveal application in our cloud environment. And we just, for this purpose of this demo, we've onboarded two applications part of it. And if you notice here, the two applications that we brought in is basically a MySQL database and a Java application. The Java application is basically a, a, a uh, example application that's serving as a quarter. And then the MySQL DB is uh, uh, behaving as an application that is generated, that is the data source for a lot of customer records, in this case, financial records or whatever it is. So what we have done since we have used the Avocado platform and pushed the plugins and automated the deployment of it, once you restart the application, the applications get discovered. Once you, once you discover your application, you'll be able to see where these applications are being accessed for, access from a real time perspective. And you see there are many folks that are trying to access it across the globe, across the globe and, and you'll be able to study where these accesses are coming from. Also, additionally, what we are doing is we, are, we have the whole construct of domain and subdomain, which are basically the ability to, for you to create trust boundaries as you onboard your application. From a threat modeling perspective, trust boundaries are critical because that helps you kind of limit the scope of exposure or understand the scope of exposure. And then in Avocado, we provide, since we are uh, at the heart of it, we enforcing zero trust, we have the ability to define these trust boundaries. Once you define the trust boundaries in this case, for this uh, uh, domain called Acme Bank, we have created a trust boundary called online. And we have onboarded both those applications into this online. And if you notice here, both these applications are in an inspection mode. And because the plugins are deployed inside the application at runtime, we are able to understand the threat surface of these applications. And if you notice here, we have this whole Pico segmentation aspect that's showing up which is basically generating all the threat surfaces and all the data exchanges that are happening between these two applications. We fingerprint every app, every flow that is happening between the applications, and we are using that level of data and the fine-grained data to generate those threat forensics that you'll see in a second. And once you have tested your application after deployment of the Avocado plugin, is then you go into our reports module, which you're basically able to generate an application model for that particular application in a particular trust domain. And once you download that JSON file, you'll be able to see what's really happening and, uh, and what kind of flows are you seeing from an application perspective within, within, uh, within that uh, uh, trust domain. In this case, what we've done, I hope you can see this, we have captured a lot of forensics for those Java applications and the MySQL database we are able to identify what the application is, what was the process, what was the IP addresses, what ports did the data get exchanged, uh, what trust domains are they part of, what protocols did it use, and also when it is talking to a peer, in this case, this Java application is talking to the MySQL database, we are able to fingerprint the MySQL database too, uh, in terms of that uh, data flow, identify what kind of data was exchanged, and also go deeper and deeper. And we have the whole ability to define specific patterns that you can capture. For example, here we have defined a, a pattern to capture all the HTTP flows in terms of identifying what kind of APIs are being accessed, what protocol, what HTTP version is being used. And all of this information and the forensics we collect will become part of how the threat model is gonna be generated. Now, what I'm going to do is I've showed you a lot of detail in terms of what the, threat, uh, what the JSON and the forensic collection looks like. Now, what I'm going to do is turn this over to uh, uh, Stuart, who's going to walk you through how to take this JSON or this forensics or this metadata and actually generate a threat model in live on, on, on the threat modeler platform. With that, I'll hand it over to uh, Stuart. Stuart, go for it. Stuart? Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Ah, super. My apologies. Of course, I was still on mute. So uh, hopefully you can all hear me okay now. What I intend to do is obviously share my screen so you can see some of what is going on. So, uh, and then I'm hoping that you can see my screen okay. Can anybody confirm? Yep, we can see your screen. Excellent. Thank you very much, Pratik. Now, 
I just want to give this a little bit of colour, if I may, just from the threat modeler perspective. Now, I am in a very fortunate position, uh, privileged, I would say, where I get to speak to uh, security teams around the world, all in different circumstances. Now, I get to show them threat modeler. Um, and ideally, we know, of course, that we want to do threat modeling at the beginning of the development lifecycle. Of course, we do but we smash into reality when we speak to customers in that they already have huge estates already deployed. So what do we do about that? Do we forget about it in a threat modeling, from a threat, threat modeling perspective? No, uh, you know, rather we didn't um, just ignore those, even if they haven't been pre-threat modeled. Now, uh, in order to answer some of the problems of uh, things already being deployed that have not been threat modeled, threat modeler develops the capability to be able to integrate directly with cloud environments such as uh, Google and Azure and AWS, of course. And in doing so, um, Threat Modeler is able to interrogate and enumerate the VPCs, VNets, and the components where you know within those, draw those down and automatically draw out a diagram inside Threat Modeler, and then to Threat Model it at the same time. Now that is pretty impressive, I'm sure you'll agree. And when I show uh, potential customers, they, you know, sometimes there's, there's a pause of silence as they uh, digest that. But a question comes, very, very often a question will come and there will it'll be something like this. Okay, that was absolutely fabulous. We can see now you have one click threat modeling automation for the cloud and the infrastructure parts of the cloud. That is amazing. What about my pre-existing apps? What about the app-centric side? And that there was the part that was missing up until now, as Cheetan rightly put it, the marriage between Threat Modeler and uh, Avocado. And so now uh, Avocado, as you just saw with Cheetan, has gone through the process of mapping uh, very forensically uh, the uh, environment and uh, deducing what is in that environment and then has produced a, a forensic JSON file. Okay, so what can I do with that on Threat Modeler's side? So I'm just going to move this out of the way. What I can do is this. Now we're looking inside Threat Modeler right now. Okay, and this is browser based. If you have credentials in a browser, everybody can take part in this threat modeling activity. And the first thing that we'll do is we'll bring up what I call the onboarding form. Okay, not uh, that interesting thus, but we'll call it the Acme Bank example. Now, there are a lot of different ways we can begin threat modeling. We could begin from scratch, completely empty. We can begin with templates. These are pre-made parts of the architecture that just tend to repeat over and over again. And it's very nice to start from the security can have baselines of security. But more pertinently for this particular webinar is we can begin through importing things such as architectural diagrams or perhaps Microsoft TMT files. And so we can reuse a lot of that work that's out there to begin this threat modeling process. But of course, now we can import avocado JSON files and that's what I want to show you. So I'll select avocado, I'll have a browse on my system Okay, and this is the JSON, forensic JSON file that was produced by Avocado, and all I need to do is import that into Threat Modeler. Okay, first it goes through a validation process, so we can see everything's in order, and we're very, very happy with this. Let's submit, let's go to our architectural diagram and see what we have. So I'm just going to submit and give it a few moments to work out uh, what it has to do. And I do apologize, I seem to have gone into stasis here. Uh, you have to enter the version numbers. Of course I do. Thank you very much for saying, what would I do without you, my friend? Okay. okay, let's submit again. We will be taken straight over to the architectural diagram screen. And here we can see what has been produced for us. Okay, this is a replica, obviously, of what we saw over in Avocado. Now, if we have a, a little look, there's a lot more than first meets the eye. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open this general tab here so that we can see what we've got. Now, we can see we have a user. That's the information we can see over here, a user. But as uh, Cheetan rightly said, a lot of information is gathered through the Avocado system. I mean, IP addresses, protocols, execution paths, 
fingerprints essentially of all communications exchanged, data, database calls, file pass of apps, you name it, it's in there. And we can see that represented in here. If I highlight this, for example, we can see that this is some kind of web server. We have the IP address and nested within that, we can see this banking portal. If I come over to the right, I can see that's a Java application. I can even see the app path. And if I click on this one here, I know that this is something to do with the URL, something like that. Now, it has even captured that MySQL uh, protocol as it's flowed across that uh, uh, interrogation from this side to this side. So we know that they are talking to each other and uh, getting information. So if I highlight this, I can see that this again is a web server, of course, with the internal IPI. And if I click there, we can see in financial records that this is in fact a database. And if I go further and click on something like user TV, we can even see that user TV is doing no good uh, from the actual <laughs> select statement for the SQL database. They are, of course, trying to enumerate admin information. OK, fine. Got a great diagram here, but surely we could have done this in avocado in one form or another. Of course, we saw that happen. So show me the money. What, what does it mean to bring it into threat model? And this is the magic. If I go over to the overview screen up here, that was brought in automatically and it was threat modeled automatically as well. So as you can see, the threat engine has deduced the appropriate threats based on what was imported from avocado in that JSON file. These threats will be broken down into the individual components. We can highlight them. We can, do, we can deal with this manually if we wish to do so. We could close them out. We can change risk. And we have a very, very good description, of course, from out of the box, from the huge IP that's available already inside Threat Modeler, we can see a very, very good description of that threat. Uh, me, as a security person, I must admit I'm more interested in the security requirements that have been generated for me. Uh, the, in other words, the action items tell me what to do in order to get rid of those threats. Uh, you know, the whatever we want to call them, uh, here they are, the controls, the mitigations, security requirements, very, very similar. These security requirements are broken down uh, per component. Uh, we can see the source name. This comes from the financial records database section. As we can see, the status is open and we could deal with these in a very manual way. Perhaps I could go in and do this uh, description here and uh, make sure this security control is in place. Going forward, we don't really want to be doing this in a very manual sense. As a security uh, person, I really want to be uh, doing this wider, um, perhaps pushing this out to engineers. And I will demonstrate that very quickly in a moment. Down below, some test cases. I like to leave test cases uh, on this screen. I could have uh, uh, shown a lot more, but just to keep it clear, uh, I've, I'm a big believer in threat modeling, driving testing. Um, I just uh, like that approach. And of course, you know, you can see it's broken down as per component again to drive that testing. Um, if, for example, I had a security requirement put in place by an engineer, perhaps I need to do that due diligence and do that testing to ensure that it is in place and doing what it should do. But I want to go further. I do want to push those security requirements out to the engineers for them to work on it. So what I'll do is I'll just quickly integrate Threat Modeler with my demo Jira environment. And I shall call Threat Stories and Security Requirements Bugs, and I shall submit. Now, of course, what this enables me to do is to push these security requirements out to the engineers, of course, ideally as early as possible so that they can start to work on these. Uh, it doesn't matter if it all pre-existed, we still need to rectify these, and this is the way that we can do that. So I can manually create a ticket, make any changes i'm not going to we're going to save that out and i'll get my issue tracker ticket number and if i go up to uh, my jira system and i change this for a seven we can see that ticket this is all the uh, information that came from the security requirement and now it's on the engineers for them to put this in place for me and of course as you might imagine this is bi-directional communication. So if I put Stu's comment in here, or if I close the ticket out, when I go back to Threat Modeler and highlight this, 
I go to my notes section. I can see Stu's comment. I could comment back. We can avoid all of those emails and spreadsheets. We're going to communicate uh, from this step model with the engineers in their tool set. This is the heart, really, of Dev DevSecOps. This is the joining together of the groups. This is what we want to do to expand beyond just the security team doing this. Of course, as you would expect, because a diagram was created and because threats and mitigations were created and all everything that this uh, threat modeling platform can do, which is pretty awesome, the reports will be generated for us as well. So that we've got exactly the same as if we'd gone in and done this manually or perhaps gone into the cloud. Great, great reporting in here. This is a developer report, so obviously focusing more in on uh, threats and mitigations for them to work on. Uh, but if I go to the field tree and just to let you sort of have a see at how much is in here, everything is in here. So, uh, you know, most of these filters are not ticked at the moment. I do like to put my threat model diagram in there if I can. So we've got custom reports, executive reports, compliance reports. I did one for a webinar when I was testing earlier. There's just very, very granular reporting. So all of this has been automated. The whole thing has been automated. It really is one click threat modeling. We achieved it in the cloud. Now we've achieved it in the web app space and we've achieved it on the on-prem space. So um, this is really, really exciting. And we can even deal with compliance. If I just say yes to that, we can then go through and see how we're progressing through our production, through our secure uh, development lifecycle in terms of compliance. And we can drill down, filter. We have so much at our fingertips now. Of course, this is on a, just a perfect model basis, but perhaps we want to go beyond that and see things in a global way. And of course, we can do exactly that. Go to our threats dashboard everything is the same as if we'd gone through in a very manual sense. Um, I don't think there's too much more I want to cover. I do apologize to everybody if I went a little bit fast. I was probably supposed to take a little more time there, but I do get very, very excited about this. This marriage between Threat Modeler and Avocado really completes things from my perspective. It really does uh, close that circle. So I'm excited about it. And if you want to see anything more of Threat Modeler, uh, including this and, of course, the cloud integration and what have you, know where to come. So I'll hand it back to the folks and uh, see where we go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stuart and Chetan, for walking everyone through uh, the joint uh, solution of one-click threat modeling for the applications. Uh, now the floor is open for questions. If you guys have any questions, you can uh, type it in the chat uh, or in the Q&A section uh, of this meeting. And uh, we have the team here to help you with any questions uh, that you guys have. I see a couple of hands being raised. If you guys can uh, type your questions in the chat, we'll be happy to answer them. Sunil and David. So I have a question here from Srikanth. How does security policy and compliance gets incorporated? So Srikanth, just to answer that, uh, Threat Modeler has an intelligent threat engine built inside. Uh, along with it, we definitely track policy compliance and security requirements as well. And those are again sourced from different compliance frameworks or uh, from different sources like OWASP, uh, Developer's Guide, and then KPEC MITRE as well. So uh, the sources are from uh, those industry standards. And then we have a threat research center who basically works round the clock to incorporate those policy compliances and security requirements in our platform for you guys. And one more thing to add to Pratik is, you know, we, we only showed you today part of the demo is the discovery and the reveal part of the uh, Avocado platform. There is an actual protect portion of the Avocado platform where the, at runtime we can provide a lot of protection. So if there are policies that need to be implemented at runtime, we can create those policies in Avocado and enforce that on the applications themselves, both from a data inspection perspective and then also in terms of how who's accessing what, uh, which application. Awesome. Chetan, there is a question for Avocado. Is it an agent-based or an API? Avocado is actually, uh, it's not an agent-based, it's a plugin-based. So think about a plugin as a shared library that sits into within, within the application environment. And every application, when it starts up, 
loads that uh, uh, shared library into its memory space. So they become part of the application and everything that we do is in line within the application. Follow up question on that one, Chetan, what is the overhead of the plugin? So the plugins typically from a, a, a CPU perspective adds about three to 5%. They are because we are sitting inside the application uh, and we are adding that overhead on the application. From a memory footprint perspective, we add about, depending upon the type of the application and the amount of data we are capturing anywhere between five megabytes to about 50 megabytes for complex applications. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chetan. Uh, Follow-up question uh, for Stuart and Chetan both. Uh, does Threat Modeler and Avocado both support container-based serverless applications, uh, so on and so forth? Do you guys, do we support that? Yeah, from an Avocado perspective, we support any uh, applications running on bare metal or virtual machines or even in containers. Uh, or microservices based architecture to support that. Serverless is on our roadmap towards uh, uh, Q, uh, Q, Q3 of uh, this year and, and, uh, um, and, and we're working towards that. Yes, and from a threat modeler perspective, the answer is yes as well. We have all of those components and the threat research centers always working on the newer technologies to ensure that we have the appropriate threats and mitigations, test cases, security requirements available to our customers. So all they need to do is choose them and drag them onto the diagram and off they go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stuart. Uh, one follow-up question again uh, for threat modeler. Uh, do you actually define threats and potential threat agents? Uh, again, the answer to that is yes. Uh, we do not do it by ourselves, but we have a team that researches uh, industry standards and things going on live in, in your actual environment and then add it to our intelligent threat engine uh, as they are discovered. A follow-up question for Avocado. Uh, does Avocado integrate seamlessly with uh, Salesforce, Apigee, Matrix, et cetera? So Avocado is focused mostly on uh, um, applications that are deployed within uh, your cloud or uh, uh, private data center. We don't operate in a SaaS environment. We don't protect or, uh, or have the ability to get into a SaaS environment. Anything that you have control over from an infrastructure perspective is where we work. If I can answer that just from a threat modeler perspective, I think that's worth covering as well. You saw uh, a native integration, obviously, with JIRA there. Um, I didn't show you just because of the nature of the webinar. There is an extensive, expansive API bidirectional uh, capabilities on the back. So if you're thinking of building your security pipeline, ensure that, uh, you know, know in your minds that you can connect it up with threat modeler. And very often, threat, threat modeler becomes the central point of that pipeline, the orchestration point. So uh, if you want to know more about the APIs, just let me know. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stuart. One question for threat modeler. Again, uh, do you guys have MITRE attack pattern as well as ICS and mobile? Uh, just to answer to that, uh, we, uh, we have MITRE attack pattern in our roadmap for Q2 of this year, and we already have ICS and mobile libraries built into Threat Modeler as of today. Awesome. The next question, uh, the plugin installation is fully transparent for the applications, question mark for uh, Avocado. Uh, it is fully transparent. The application does not know that the plugin is there, part of it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Moving on, uh, is this a separate licensing or also to be offered as a bundle? So just to answer to that, uh, we offer a bundle together as well. And if you guys are interested in purchasing Avocado separately or Threat Modeler separately, that is an option available as well. So uh, there is a bundle that goes together for you. Follow-up question on compliance for Threat Modeler, Stuart. Uh, do you have compliance for SOC 2 type 2 and ISO, I, yeah, go ahead. No, I, if, if we're talking about Threat Modeler itself, the platform, or if it's inside, I know that um, uh, we can adhere to 
uh, you know, ISO in terms of the framework and, and, you know, have them as part of the threat modeling process, but I'm not sure if it's referring to the platform itself. I know that SOC 2 is underway at the moment, so yep. I wasn't quite sure where, where that one was. Yep, uh, you ex uh, answered it correct, so yep. Yeah, the same applies to the SOC 2 is underway. Awesome, so again, uh, just to follow the platform itself is underway of getting SOC 2 compliance. Uh, Chetan, a question for you. What app platforms are supported by Avocado? Uh, basically, Avocado, since it's uh, language agnostic, when we talk about app platform, we're talking about it supports Java, Python, uh, C++, Node.js, does not matter what your application is written in, we will be able to work with it. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll take two or three more questions. Uh, one question, uh, Chetan and uh, Stuart, for both of you, does Avocado and Threat Modeler work with the mainframe code, like COBOL? Uh, from a threat, uh, Avocado perspective, right now we don't support mainframe, but if your mainframe is running Linux, uh, we do support it. In that case, COBOL will be supported. The, the underpinnings of threats model, obviously, I didn't have time to go into this, but the heart of it is editability and customization. We endeavor to get you as far forward as we can, but if you have things like COBOL and you want that to be part of your threat modeling, it is all open to you to bring in any components or security requirements, mitigations, regulations, all of that is in your power. So if you wish to bring that in, and of course, if you have something unusual and you want to talk to us about it, bringing that into the platform, please do so. Make us aware because the Threat Research Center can always work on these things for you as well. So just keep the lines of communication open. Awesome, thank you so much to her. And just so that I can uh, highlight uh, the capabilities and support of Avocado and Threat Model together, as well as out of uh, this integration, all of us support cloud-based apps, non-cloud-based apps, uh, mobile, IoT, uh, ICS, uh, all those type of applications, on-premise architectures are also supported by Threat Modeler uh, as part of it. Awesome. We have uh, one last question uh, for Chetan and Stuart. How can we leverage Avocado and TM for new applications that are under development? Uh, yeah, so typically what, what we kind of recommend for new applications under development is to leverage Avocado in your QA or a development test phase. So when there's code already developed and the application developer is trying to test the code, you leverage that to assess the threat surface of that application that was being built or is in the process of completion of build. New applications and services is the heartbeat of threat modeling, of course. We want to do threat modeling right at the beginning so we can engineer those security requirements into what we're building and designing rather than bolting security on the end when we find there's a problem. So absolutely, it is ideal if we can bring Threat Modeler to the play as we are building out and designing new applications and services. Awesome, thank you so much Stuart and Chetan for taking the questions from our audience. Uh, the rest of the questions that we have open in Q&A will be answered uh, via chat today. Uh, so please stay on for another 10 minutes. We'll be answering those questions uh, in the next 15 minutes. Uh, apart from that, thank you so much everyone for joining our session today. I hope this was helpful. Uh, if you guys want to set up a demo, you guys can reach out to both Avocado or Threat Modeler team and we can basically set up a demo for you guys uh, and can take the discussion over from there. Awesome. Thank you so much.